Hello and welcome again. In this video, I'll be looking at the Quranic chapter that upon close objective examination, consistently shows Muhammad was just another false prophet who continuously failed at challenges to prove his claim to prophethood. Chapter 18 or Surah 18 is Surat Al-Kahf, meaning the chapter of the cave. The story goes that it was revealed to Muhammad to help him respond to a challenge that would somehow prove his prophethood by asking him about old legends that he would know about if he was a true prophet. Muhammad had up until then consistently brushed off any demand that he showed them any physical miracle to prove his prophethood and legitimacy, brushing these requests aside with convenient excuses. I'm going to stray away from the topic of this particular chapter for a minute first, but it's important I give a few examples so we can understand how Muhammad was asked to prove his prophethood and what his excuses were to avoid coming up with a miracle he was clearly incapable of producing. Chapter 3 verse 183 refers to the Jews. They said, Allah took our promise not to believe in a messenger unless he showed us a sacrifice consumed by fire. Say, there came to you messengers before me with clear signs and even with what ye ask for. Why then did ye slay them if ye speak the truth? This is clearly a non sequitur. This doesn't follow. Muhammad is telling them, look, I mean, if you want me to do a small basic miracle like sacrifice an animal by fire brought down from the sky, I'm not going to do that because your ancestors killed messengers. It just doesn't follow. It's a logical fallacy. In chapter 6 verse 8, the skeptics around Muhammad were asking for angels to prove his message. They say, why is not an angel sent down to him? If we did send down an angel, the matter would be settled at once and no respite would be granted them. Now, what is meant by respite here? If we look to the commentary in the tafsirs, it tells us that anyone who gets a sign then has to believe immediately, otherwise they would be destroyed straight away. Once again, another ridiculous excuse for not providing a miracle. In the same chapter, verse 37, and they say, why has not a sign been sent down to him from his Lord? Say, surely Allah is able to send down a sign, but most of them do not know. That's just a nonsense response. I mean, most of them do not know what. If you look at some of the commentaries, they'll suggest that this knowledge is the fact that if they see a miracle and they still don't believe it, they would have to be destroyed as a people. By this point, the pagans knew he wasn't a prophet, so much so that they were willing to put their necks on the line. So they told him they weren't afraid of dying just to prove his message. They would in effect sacrifice their life and afterlife in return for others seeing definitive proof of Muhammad's prophethood. Chapter 8 31 to 33 And when our communications are recited to them they say, We have heard indeed, if we pleased we could say the like of it. This is nothing but the stories of the ancients. And when they said, O oh Allah, if this is the truth from thee, then rain upon us stones from heaven or inflict on us a painful punishment. But Allah was not going to chastise them while you were among them, nor is Allah going to chastise them while yet they ask for forgiveness. Another poor excuse. Couldn't God have struck them alone without harming Muhammad? Doesn't he have laser-guided technology at his disposal? I mean, surely he's capable of anything. Couldn't Muhammad have ordered them to stand 50 meters away before this punishment was carried out as a sign for all Meccans to see? It says they were asking for forgiveness, but they clearly weren't. They were constantly challenging him and mocking him. Why would any just and fair God demand anyone believe without evidence? Muslims often say the Quran is literally a masterpiece in Arabic, but that is a subjective view. We just saw by reading verse 831 that the pagans at the time said the Quran wasn't impressive linguistically and that they could easily come up with verses similar to it. Muslims would say they failed to match the Quran. Non-Muslims will say they succeeded. It's subjective and should in no way be the sole criteria for which the pagans are to be judged when they believe all prior prophets had miracles and that Muhammad should show them anything impossible. Now I know some Muslims will claim Muhammad split the moon and NASA have confirmed this, but this is ludicrous and NASA have obviously denied saying such a thing. The absence of other civilizations not witnessing this split of the moon speaks volumes, so let's not even go there. But despite all these excuses, Muhammad eventually did accept one very easy challenge to try and prove his prophethood to the skeptics. This story is told in the Sirah, Muhammad's life story in the Ibn Hisham edit on pages 133 to 141, and also mentioned in all major tafsirs including Tabari, Qurtubi, and Ibn Kathir. I don't expect or want anyone to believe what I say on faith, so as usual with all my videos, all my sources are linked in the description box so you can check them for yourselves. Now we're going to start here at the second paragraph where it says when Al-Nadr said to them. Uh, just to clarify, Al-Nadr is in reference to Al-Nadr ibn al-Harith. He's, uh, he's a man who was very skeptical of Muhammad, uh, who told him his messages were nothing but ancient tales. And as we're going to see later, he's going to cause him some embarrassment with this story. This is obviously not taken lightly by Muhammad. And when Al-Nadr is eventually captured by the Muslims, he is executed. The background to this is that Al-Nadr had gone to the tribes in Quraysh who were skeptical of Muhammad's message. And he was told to go and talk to the Jewish rabbis who were more informed about the history of the prophets and how and how one would go about confirming whether a prophet is genuine or not. When Al-Nadr said that to them, they sent him and Uqba to the Jewish rabbis in Medina and said to them, ask them about Muhammad, describe him to them and tell them what he says. 
for they are the first people of the scriptures and have knowledge which we do not possess about the prophets. They carried out their instructions and said to the rabbis, You are the people of the Torah, and we have come to you so that you can tell us how to deal with this tribesman of ours. The rabbis said, Ask him about three things of which we will instruct you. If he gives you the right answer, then he is an authentic prophet. But if he does not, then the man is a rogue, so form your own opinion about him. Ask him what happened to the young men who disappeared in ancient days, for they have a marvellous story. Ask him about the mighty traveller who reached the confines of both east and west. Ask him what the spirit is. If he can give you the answer, then follow him, for he is a prophet. If he cannot, then he is a forger, and treat him as you will. The two men returned to Quraysh at Mecca and told them that they had a decisive way of dealing with Muhammad, and they told them about the three questions. They came to the apostle and called upon him to answer these questions. He said to them, I will give you your answer tomorrow. But he did not say, if God wills. So they went away, and the apostle, so they say, waited for 15 days without a revelation from God on the matter. Nor did Gabriel come to him, so that the people of Mecca began to spread evil reports, saying, Muhammad promised us an answer on the morrow, and today is the 15th day we have remained without an answer. This delay caused the apostle great sorrow, until Gabriel brought him the chapter of the cave, in which he reproaches him for his sadness, and told him the answers of their questions, the youth, the mighty traveller, and the spirit. I was told that the apostle said to Gabriel when he came, you have shut yourself off from me, Gabriel, so that I became apprehensive. He answered, we descend only by God's command, whose is what lies before us, behind us, and what lies between, and thy Lord does not forget. Before I explain the story in a little more detail, did you catch what happened at the end? Muhammad, claiming to be frustrated because he was made to look like a fraud, tells Gabriel why he didn't come earlier. And Gabriel answers, and his response becomes a verse in the Quran in chapter 19, verse 64. So, not all the Quran is God's literal word, as Muslims will claim. As this particular verse was Gabriel responding to Muhammad, I find it a little bizarre that this made it into the Quran. Most other conversations we hear about between Muhammad and Gabriel don't get quoted as verses within the Quran. We just hear about them in hadith. But you know what? We'll let it slip and get back to the main topic. So the pagans, back from their advice of how to test Muhammad by the Jews, asked Muhammad about the story of the sleepers of Ephesus, an old legend that is largely recognized as a myth, even within the church itself. Created in the early days of Christianity to show the dedication of its followers and based on other myths of long-duration sleepers, why the Jews would say this is a great story, given the protagonists were followers of Jesus, is beyond me and makes little sense. They also ask him about the spirit and about a man who ruled the entire world, from its eastern boundaries to its western boundaries. I hope he can maybe tell them the earth isn't flat and east and west is subjective to your specific location and not an actual physical place on earth. Or at least tell them there is a lot of land in the Americas that has yet to be discovered by the populations in Afro-Eurasia. Let's see how he handled this challenge. The original myth has seven sleepers, and it has their names, their religion, the name of the rulers when they fell asleep and when they woke up, how long they slept for in a cave, the location of the cave, and plenty of other details. So, we would naturally expect a challenge like this to yield not only the information available to them at the time, but even more information to put the issue beyond doubt to the skeptics or, at the very least, tell them that it was just a man-made legend that was purely fiction. The story of the cave begins in chapter 18's ninth verse, and that's where we will pick up. Let's see how much information Muhammad managed to get them two weeks later than he originally said he would. Remember, this is a direct challenge to his prophethood and is very simple and doesn't require any form of miracle, just access to someone who knows the stories of the legends. Or, do you think that the fellows of the cave and the inscription were of our wonderful signs? When the youth sought refuge in the cave, they said, Our Lord, grant us mercy from thee, and provide for us a right course in our affair. So we prevented them from hearing in the cave for a number of years. Notice how vague everything is so far. Certainly not impressive as a direct challenge to prove his prophethood. Let's continue reading. Then we raised them up that we might know which of the two parties was best able to compute the time for which they remained. We relate to you their story with the truth. Surely there were youths who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. And we strengthened their hearts with patience when they stood up and said, Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We will by no means call upon any God besides him, for indeed we should have said an extravagant thing. If you ever read the Quran, you'll notice this is one pattern with all loyal worshippers, monotheism. We don't hear that much about what else these people do, except that they were people who believe in one God and were persecuted. So, not a lot of information yet. These, our people, have taken gods besides him. Why do they not produce any clear authority in their support? Who is then more unjust than he who forges a lie against Allah? So again, criticizing polytheism, still waiting for names, exact details, what happened, and so on. 
and when you forsake them and what they worship save Allah, betake yourselves for refuge to the cave. Your Lord will extend to you largely of his mercy and provide for you a profitable course in your affair. And you might see the sun when it rose decline from their cave towards the right hand and when it set leave them behind on the left while they were in a wide space thereof. This is of the signs of Allah. Whomsoever Allah guides, he is the rightly guided one. And whomsoever he causes to err, you shall not find for him any friend to lead him aright. Someone explain this scientifically, please. How does the sun avoid them by dodging its photons away from the entrance to the cave every day so it doesn't wake them up? Seems like a lot of hard work for the sun. And you might think them awake while they were asleep and we turn them about to the right and to the left while their dog lay out stretching its paws at the entrance. If you looked at them, you would certainly turn back from them in flight and you would certainly be filled with awe because of them. Well, now we have a bit of detail. The dog stretched his paws at the entrance of the cave. Seems slightly useless information but we want detail, so I guess we'll take the dog stretching. And thus did we rouse them that they might question each other. A speaker amongst them said, how long have you tarried? They said, we have tarried for a day or part of a day. Tarried here means slept. Others said, your Lord knows best how long you have tarried. Now send one of you with this silver coin of yours to the city. Then let him see which of them has purest food, so let him bring you provision from it. And let him behave with gentleness and by no means make your case known to anyone. For surely if they prevail against you, they would stone you to death or force you back to their religion. And then you will never succeed. And thus we did make men to get knowledge of them that they might know that Allah's promise is true and that as for the hour, there is no doubt about it. When they disputed among themselves about their affair and said, erect an edifice over them, their Lord best knows them. Those who prevailed in their affair said, we will certainly raise a masjid over them. The story has lost a bit of chronology there. It has told us they woke up, thought they were still in a country run by people hostile to their faith, but that they are good people who should have a mosque built over them. Well, the truth is, Muslims during Muhammad's time themselves didn't really know who suggested the mosque being built. Some believe it was fellow believers, while others believed it was their enemies. This is detailed in the Tafsir of Tabari and also mentioned in Ibn Kathir among others. So we can see that even Muslims were confused by this story, and Muhammad's attempts to answer this challenge wasn't even understood by them. But let's just let this one slip too. What happened here? When did they die? What happened when they went to the town? The story has skipped several important points. Some say, if you've ever watched Top Gear in the UK, you'll understand what some say refers to. Usually it precedes complete nonsense or ambiguity, but let's see what detail we get from this story to prove his prophethood after he waited a fortnight for this revelation. Some say they are three, the fourth of them being their dog. And others say five, the sixth of them being their dog, making conjectures of what is unknown. And others yet say seven, and the eighth of them is their dog. Say, my Lord best knows their number, none knows them but a few. Therefore contend not in the matter of them, but with an outward contention, and do not question concerning any of them. Ah, oh, geez, that was useful. Some say it's three people, some say it was five, some say seven. But Allah doesn't want to tell us. He has a reason, of course. Why wouldn't he want us to know exactly how many people were in the cave? Especially given that this was a direct challenge for him to prove his prophethood. So God has really screwed over Muhammad here by not helping him out in giving out the figure. But hey, there must be a reason. Even if we can't see a reason or understand what purpose is behind hiding the figure of Quave Dollars in the legend. Call me a skeptic, but I think the way this conversation went was he told the pagans he would come back with their questions the next day, didn't find his buddy who would tell him, or found his buddy and his buddy didn't know either, so he couldn't go back and admit he was a false prophet the next day. He hoped they would completely forget about it, but they kept insisting, and some of his followers became confused. He thought he needed to say something, just anything, to get them off his back, so he came up with a masterclass in vagueness. And do not say of anything, surely I will do it tomorrow, unless Allah pleases. And remember your Lord when you forget and say, maybe my Lord will guide me to a nearer course to the right than this. So for those that think the story of him not giving an answer straight away is rubbish, well, it's here in the Quran, preceded and followed by verses related to the cave story. So it's very likely in reference to the story of him failing to provide them with the story the following day as he had promised. What's the reason? Well, Muhammad forgot to say inshallah, or God willing. Remember this next time you hear anyone say inshallah. They probably don't know why it ever became a thing in Islam. Well, it's because of this story. So Allah basically screws Muhammad over again by being sulky that his prophet didn't say God willing. He delayed his own messenger and radically heightened all suspicions surrounding his claim to prophethood. He could have rebuked him at the time and given him proper answers and told him don't do it again, but he chose not to. And they remained in their cave 300 years and add nine. Say, Allah knows best how long they remained. To him are the unseen things of the heavens and the earth, how clear his sight and how clear his hearing. There is none to be a guardian for them besides him, and he does not make anyone his associate in his judgment. So here it appears we finally get some concrete information. He appears to tell them that the cave dwellers slept in the cave for 309 years. The original legend was 208 years in some cases and 360 in others. The problem is, if we look at the respected exegesis of the Quran, such as that of Tabari, 
we find that what is meant by this is far from clear. In one instance, Tabari claims that another variation of the Qur'an actually clearly said, and they say they remained in their cave 309 years, say Allah knows best. That's two entire words that appear in one version of the Qur'an, Ibn Mas'uds, that we don't find in today's version. So much for the Qur'an's perfect preservation. The tafsir also says some say the 309 was a figure said by the Jews, but Allah just said that he knows and didn't bother to tell the rest of us. While some claim that Allah is in fact telling us that they slept for 309 years. Ah, confusion, confusion. I could have sworn there was a verse in there somewhere telling me the Quran's verse were explained in detail. So in the end, we didn't really get any useful information from this story. And despite taking a lot longer to gather his story, it still failed pretty miserably as a response to arguably the biggest challenge for him to prove his prophethood. The chapter then, in typical Quran fashion, starts changing topics a little randomly, initially telling people listening to this story who were clearly still skeptical that they can believe it or disbelieve it. And those who disbelieve it will be thrown to hell with molten brass thrown onto their faces to burn them when they ask for water to quench their thirst. So again, Muhammad needs to resort to threats to terrorize people into the faith. Their gods probably weren't as nasty as Allah, so he's banking on them succumbing to the biggest bully of a god. The chapter then suddenly switches to a couple of unrelated parables before quick references to the Day of Judgment, and then jumping back to the story of Adam's creation in heaven and Satan's rebellion before eventually reaching this verse. And certainly we have explained in this Quran every kind of example, and man is most of all given to contention. Muhammad doesn't seem to enjoy the constant questions and skepticism. He's quoting God as being slightly frustrated with the questions here. Ah, oh, you humans and your questions, why can't you be more like plants and animals? Just living without questions. So the next part of the challenge was telling them about the soul. Given that the Quran is not arranged in correct chronological order, the response to this question comes in the surah preceding this chapter of the cave. It comes in number 17, which is commonly referred to as the chapter of the Israelites, verse 85. And they ask you about the soul. Say the soul is one of the commands of my Lord, and you are not given aught of knowledge but a little. Really, Muhammad? This is your answer to the second part of the challenge? What he's basically saying is, oh, you want to know about the soul? Well, God says he's not telling anyone, so there. One more part of this challenge remains. Muhammad has answered the first two quite disappointingly. Let's see how he fares with the legend of the man who ruled the entire world without credible historians knowing anything about it. I will leave this for a video all on its own, because, spoiler alert, this man coming up in the next chapter of the cave gets to see exactly where the sun sets here on earth. I will take all the apologist arguments claiming it's not meant literally and set the record straight for anyone with the slightest intellectual honesty to take on board. So await the next video on this chapter soon, the story of Dhul Qarnayn, and in particular, his visit to the sun somewhere down a road to the west of the earth. As always, share this video, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter and other social media links. Until next time, inshallah. Ha, see, I didn't forget to say that because I wouldn't want any unnecessary delays until the next video. So inshallah, I will see you next time for the video on Dhul Qarnayn and more on this chapter of the cave.